This video is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. Hi, I'm Travis and this is Curious Tangents, and how can you be more creative? In my last video, I gave you guys a riddle and far more of you solved it than I was anticipating. If you're still wondering, the answer was that you needed to take the weaker rays and then line them up at different angles to intersect the patient's tumor. This way, you could remove the tumor by doing as little damage to the patient's brain as possible. This riddle was meant to mimic the way that Darwin went about his creative processes, drawing information from multiple fields and arriving in one place. Author and economist Tim Harford would call this slow motion multitasking, and it's the first of the ways that you can be more creative. Mastering your craft is a great idea. Mastering multiple is a better one. The second way to be more creative is through deep analogical thinking. In the year 1600, Giordano Bruno, Italian philosopher, educator, and quote unquote radical, was being burned at the stake for teaching that there was more than one solar system. Now, technically, Bruno was wrong. There is but one solar system, and it's the one that we live in. However, there's an estimated 100 billion planetary systems within our own Milky Way, and an incalculable amount within the entire universe. What Giordano Bruno would have meant to say is that there are other planetary systems, things that function very similar to our own solar system, though they're not the sun, so they're not solar. Though he probably doesn't deserve to be burned at the stake even though he was, technically wrong. About four years before that burning took place, a Johannes Kepler, yes, the humanoid version of this telescope, was busy accepting the Copernican model of the universe and asking some rather difficult and controversial questions. You see, at this time, the leading analogy for the universe, the leading conception for the universe, was called the clockwork universe. It was thought that the universe pretty much revolved around the Earth, but it was also thought that all those celestial bodies, all the stars and other planets, even the sun, were contained in crystalline spheres. The crystal was too perfect for human eyes to see, and every single planet possessed a soul or a spirit that was its driving force. It was thought that the reason why the planets moved was because they had a driving spirit within them. Yes, this was common thought in the 1500s, I know it's wild, stick with me. It was also thought that the crystalline structures that the planets were stuck in was itself connected to all of the other crystalline structures. Essentially, when things changed from day to night or when planets moved, it was because that universal clock was ticking, which is in a very metaphorical way kind of true. But anyway, Johannes Kepler, seeing comets trace across the sky, began to wonder how those comets didn't break the perfect crystalline structure that the universe was supposedly in. Kepler would also notice that planets that were further away appeared to move slower, and he wondered how this could be if the universe was structured like a clock. He thought perhaps that planets that were further away had weaker moving souls. He also figured that that was pretty arbitrary and made no sense just like moving souls. Because of the nature of the questions that Johannes Kepler was asking, there was no real body of evidence for him to pull from, and so he had to rely on analogy. One of Kepler's first analogies was that the power behind the soul of the sun worked a lot like heat did. As heat leaves its source, it dissipates, and so he thought that the sun would work in the same way. This analogy was, obviously, not perfect. If something gets in the way of the source of heat, then it's largely blocked, whereas the sun affects everything in the solar system, and Kepler knew this. Kepler thought that instead of there being many spirits, there could be just one that laid inside of the sun. Heat can also be detected at any point in its path, whereas the energy from the sun appeared to only interact when it hit another body. He would then begin to analogize the spirit as light, because light does not have that same problem. He began using words like force and power instead of soul or spirit, and this became the precursor to gravity. This was pretty groundbreaking because he did this before science embraced the notion that there were physical forces that acted throughout the entire universe. I've said before that creativity works a lot like connecting the dots, and if your experience and knowledge are the dots, then your ability to analogize between them are the connections. When you buy a new car, you probably start to notice more of that car on the road, though it's incredibly unlikely that that car became more common as you bought it. What is actually happening is that you pay more attention to things that are familiar. When you're at a party and you hear your name being called, it's not because your name is the only name that's been called. 
It's because your name is the most familiar. Your name is the thing that's important to you, and so it's highlighted among all of the others. If you've seen my top 10 video, then you may have caught this, but this Rubik's Cube constantly changes throughout the video. You don't pay attention to it because it's just a Rubik's Cube and that's not very important. And I will no longer touch that throughout the video, so no need to pay any attention to it. The point is that your brain doesn't really comprehend the entire world. It doesn't see the whole picture. It sees the world through the lens of the things that it deems important. It does the same with information, though that's another video. I have for a very long time read lots of books, but only recently have I thought how the ideas in those books could become cool YouTube videos. When I look at landscapes, no matter how beautiful a landscape is, I generally don't think about what a great picture it can make. But if you're a painter, then you could probably think of how anything could make a great picture. What I'm trying to say here is that the more you work on your craft, the more you can see the world through the lens of your craft, and the more novel ideas you can have. The more frequently that you do something, the more often that you work on it, the more your brain can associate novel things with it. The next thing that you can do to be more creative is called strategic procrastination. Adam Grant, American psychologist and author of Originals, How Nonconformists Change the World, and many good TED Talks talks of this often. If you give someone a difficult, non-intuitive problem to solve and put them on a timer, they probably won't solve it. If you give that same person that counterintuitive problem before they go to bed, they will likely dream about it, and when they wake up, they are more likely to solve it than their peers who simply waited an hour and then tried again. Fun fact, a really similar thing happens with mice in mazes. If you put a mouse through a maze several times, when that mouse is asleep, its brain activity mimics what it was doing while it was running the maze, which is really cool. The advice comes down to choosing to do difficult things over longer periods of time so that you have more time to think about it. As Aaron Sorkin said, you call it procrastination, I call it thinking. Next is happiness. You may have heard the myth of the depressed artist, and it's a myth. The myth of the depressed artist has existed since the time of Plato, and many artists have had mental illnesses, though there is very little evidence that being depressed actually makes you more artistic. There is, however, a ton of evidence that being happy makes you more creative. People who are happier or in a more positive mood have more plastic brains than those who are depressed. Being depressed or having ants automated negative thoughts decreases your brain's plasticity, which means a decreased ability to make connections. If you read the biographies of most of these depressed artists, you'll find that most of their works came not while they were depressed. If you've ever struggled with depression, this is probably not incredibly surprising, as doing almost anything can be difficult if you're depressed, let alone creating your magnum opus. The tortured artist stereotype is but an unnecessary romanticization of mental illness that we should probably quit doing on a cultural level. But that's another video. And lastly, stay curious. You and I are essentially matter that has woken up, and this awareness will end soon. We are occupying a brief period of light between what may be two infinite voids of darkness. So shed light where you can. And thanks for watching.